Hello everyone and welcome to our very first uh, Lifting the Veil lecture series. Uh, today the title of our very first is uh, Clinical Trial Participation, a Compelling Case for African and Afro-Diasporic Communities. I am Toyin Adewumi and I am the Executive Director of Tambo Foundation. I would love to use this opportunity to welcome you. You could have been anywhere else, um, but uh, you chose to spend the next two hours with us. And for that, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, before we go into the gist of uh, today's conversation, I would like to present a little bit about the foundation, who we are, where we are, and what we hope to achieve. So we are a nonprofit organization uh, registered currently in the US. We were officially established July, 2017. This was around the time that I had finished my round of chemo. I'm currently a four year breast cancer survivor. And so the goal was to be a voice of awareness on the diagnosis and treatability of uh, the major cancers that affect Africans. Officially, we launched July 2019. So the vision was conceived 2017, but it didn't come to fruition two years later. We exist because one of the goals for us is to help strip off the stigma attached to being African and having cancer. We also would love to spread awareness on the, some of the major cancers. So breast, prostate, lung, cervical um, cancers, and that are prevalent amongst African and African migrant populations. If they're caught early, uh, they are treatable. And so our goal is that we'll have less unnecessary deaths. In the long term, our goal is to join forces on the African continent to push an African solution to African problems. That is sort of, will help bring about a winnable war on cancer treatment. Why? Right now in the US, the changing, there's a changing demographic in the US Black population. In the past 40 years, the Black immigrant population in the US has quadrupled. So it was 816,000 officially in 1980. And by 2017, there are more than 4.1 million African migrant populations in the US. Here we see 18% coming from Jamaica, 17% from Haiti, and 38% from African countries. And guess what? Of the 38%, 7% are Nigerians. So where one, where one or two Black people are gathered, there's a Nigerian. That's my little spiel. Also, uh, research has shown that uh, between 2012 and 2032, there's going to be a 70% increase in cancer cases worldwide. And currently one in five low and middle income countries have, you know, to date have the proper data to drive cancer policy. So we really cannot wait. As many people as can join, the better. Uh, what are some of the things that we've done so far? In the patient education side, one of the things that we have achieved is try to do a bit of digital um, education in African languages. So right now on our YouTube page, we have a couple of uh, infomercials talking about what cancer is and what patients should do, should do if they're diagnosed. And we've started with breast cancer um, to begin to sort of do some information on that. And currently we have them in Yoruba, in Chui, in Igbo, and we're also working with um, a Hausa health educator in Nigeria currently to help translate and make those available. The end goal is that these um, patient education materials will be free to anybody working on the continent to use as part of their patient education purposes. So we're creating this so that we can help those on the continent because at the end of the day, you cannot chip at 
a disease or an issue if you cannot meet people at the cultural level. So this is one of the ways that we're looking to close the patient equity gap. Um, in the patient support services side, we've been able to help provide funding for about four families who needed a couple of, you know, some funds towards their surgical care in Kenya, in Nigeria, and in Canada. We've also helped 10 families with nutrition services, so about $100 gift cards for two to three months. We also uh, worked with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to provide sort of uh, hair bonnets for breast cancer patients. So uh, one of the side effects of chemo is that you go bald and uh, the scalp can be very tender. So we worked with uh, a couple of uh, African-based businesses who make hair bonnets to provide others those and then we supply them to Dana-Farber. Another area that we help with in patient support is to help with patient advocacy. Oftentimes when patients receive the first diagnosis, they don't know what to do. And I call it the cancer care machine can be very overwhelming. And so when we get referrals to the foundation, we help provide what we call patient advocacy support and psychosocial support so that they know what they're going into, a lady affairs about treatment, and and help them with questions that they can talk to with their providers. Now on the outreach and partnership side, uh, before, COVID, before COVID hit, we sponsored the World Cancer Screening Day uh, and joined hands with a medical center in Lagos, Nigeria to help screen 325 participants for breast cancer, cervical cancer and prostate cancer. We also work in hand in hand with Judah Foundation, which is a cancer survivorship foundation. So obviously there's life before and life after cancer treatment. And that in itself, the survivorship aspect is very important. So we found um, a foundation on the continent that's doing work and we're looking to partner with more to help them with resources that they need to ensure that uh, survivors continue to thrive and not just uh, live like a shell of their former self. Here in uh, Massachusetts, on the outreach side, we've worked with uh, the Yoruba community of Massachusetts and the Nigerian Islamic Society of Massachusetts to do outreach and advocacy programs. We're looking to expand on that as well. So given that Massachusetts is uh, our hometown, we want to make sure that we're fully grounded and rooted here before we begin to spread to other New England states and other states in the US and also long-term on the continent. It's a lot of work and we hope that even as you're listening, you'll continue to partner with us. We are in a new season right now. And so new seasons call for new strategies. Cancer is not waiting. The focus has been on COVID-19 and rightfully so. But the truth is experts are telling us that COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic. So if it's not going to be the last pandemic, we need to bridge the health equity gaps. We have to participate in the process as Africans, as people of color, as people of African descent. And we need the right information from trusted sources. And so our goal and our hope is that when it comes to getting the right information from the right source, you will look to Tambo Foundation for that. You would not have to second guess that there is an agenda behind it. Also, and most importantly, the future of medicine requires that we participate. Um, in a couple of years, it's going to be precision medicine. And so if we're not participating as patients, if we're not participating um, at the different levels of health equity and medicine, the continent will be, left, will be left behind. People of African descent will be left behind. Black people will be left behind. And so we need to have these conversations and not just have the conversations, but come with actionable items that will continue to push the message forward. Well, today I bring to you seasoned speakers to talk about the need for us to participate in clinical trials. And first, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Cynthia Echo. She is a senior research with one of the largest clinical research organizations in the US. 
Uh, she was a medical, she's a medical graduate from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And her career in research began 15 years ago as a senior medical officer with the National Institute of Pharma Pharmaceutical Research and Development, Abuja, Nigeria. She has worked on clinical trials on many fronts, working with subjects and research participants, investigators, sponsors, and regulatory agencies. Next on our panel is Dr. Linda Agu. She is currently a clinical research associate with uh, Covance uh, Incorporated in partnership with Merck. She also has over 12 years of experience as a clinical research associate. Her primary uh, duties include ensuring um, that uh, site staff conduct clinical trials in accordance with the company's SOPs and in conformity with good clinical practice. She helps to bridge the gap between the sponsor and the site. Last but not least, we have with us Dr. Kingsley Undo, who is the co-founder of Register Incorporation. This is a startup focused on reducing disparities in cancer outcomes in underserved groups using artificial intelligence and big data. He is also a clinical assistant professor of global health at the University of Washington and an affiliate member of the Vaccines and Infectious Disease Division of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. His research focuses on reducing the disparities in cancer control outcomes in low and middle income countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So please help me to welcome this seasoned panelist. And now I'm going to um, open the floor to Dr. Cynthia as she is going to be our very first panelist. Dr. Cynthia, over to you. Wow, um, good morning, everyone. I wanted to say I'm speechless, but it's not time to be speechless yet. <laughs> yeah. But congratulations. I think this is a very worthy course. Um, a great presentation, what you um, what you presented and what you're doing. You know, I really love the part about patient support. Um, you know, just coming in from the angle of the people who have been left behind. Um, so I, I, I will go on with my presentation. My job here is basically an introduction. We have the other speakers who would, um, you know, further true light on um, um, diversity in clinical trials and the way forward. So mine is just, well, introduction. <laughs> so, like I said, I was asked to discuss why clinical trials, what do they mean and why are they important? Um, really? My slides? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so why and um, what's the importance? We're looking for answers. That's the simple, you know, um, answer. Sorry for my tautology, but we're looking for answers. Clinical trials is all about discovery. Um, you know, my husband is a preacher and one of his favorite lines is that, you know, it tells people, because you know where we're coming from, I'm talking about the black race, Africans, that God really is the greatest scientist and that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, medical scientists are only discovering what God has put into creation for man. You know, like the Bible says, he's giving us everything for life. So, that's what clinical trial is, is about. It's about discovery. And, you know, we have many unmet medical needs. And of course, top on the list, like you mentioned, cancer. We're racing to cure cancer. And I strongly believe that someday that, you know, that will come to pass, in fact, very soon. Um, laboratory and animal studies, you know, people would say, so why don't we limit this trials, this testing? to the laboratory and animal studies. The truth is, it's just not enough. We need clinical trials. We need to test this um, drugs and new treatment in humans um, because we, you know, how do we know what works and what doesn't work unless we test it? So it simply cannot be learned in the laboratory or animal studies alone. And um, 
My next slide is just to give you an idea of the process that is involved in um, discovering new treatments, new drugs, and you know, um, getting it to the market. It's really a long process could be complicated, but one thing about it is that it's not just people um, trying to make money. Like, you know, people have this preconception that, okay, bio, biopharmaceutical companies are just out there to, to make money. No, it's heavily regulated. You know, this slide shows how long it takes um, from, you know, the concept of a drug, because that's where it all starts from. Somebody thinks about, okay, there's this unmet medical need uh, and we could do this, we could do that, you know, discovers this compound. It takes about 10 to 15 years, you know, before they conclude on that compound and, you know, that, okay, it works and we can put it out there. And that's where clinical trials come comes in, you know, takes 10 to five years on average for the drug to travel from the laboratory to the market. And, um, so a little more just to give an, an overview of clinical trials is that, um, so every day medical scientists are coming up with new compounds, but you know, like millions, thousands, but only about 5,000 really get into um, the preclinical testing, the laboratory and been tested in animals. And even that is a long process and it's also regulated to a degree, it takes about six to seven years, you know, and what are they testing? They want to just make sure is this safe in a living organism? And they want to formulate, you know, have a formulation they, that they can then test in humans. Then when they're done with that, um, before they can even begin testing in human, they have to file what we call um, investigation on new drug application to the FDA. So you see how controlled this is. Um, before they say, oh, okay, we think, you know, this makes sense. They weigh it. Um, yeah, go ahead. So they begin. And we begin with phase one. And that is a short period. It's about one to two years. Um, it's limited. You just want a few participants. And here, this is first human. So we're really testing for safety again. And we're trying to determine the minimum tolerated dose, you know, and it goes on to phase two, where we expand, we need more participants, we want to check for efficacy, we want to make sure this drug really works, and we're gathering data. I mean, clinical trial is all about data, to see, okay, what are the side effects? And, you know, it goes from that phase to phase three, where we expand more, we include more people, because we really want to be sure about this. Um, so that's the last phase before you can file to the FDA to say, oh, here is our data. This is what we have found. Okay, this is efficacy, you know, put it, put all that together. So now we want to file for a new drug approval. And trust me, that doesn't just pass into the market. The FDA will review this, thoroughly review. In fact, I forgot to mention that we also have um, independent safety review committees who they present this data too, and they would look at it, it would scrutinize it um, before these drugs would be, you know, um, they, before they can go to the market. So it's a very tedious process. It's expensive, um, but it is worth it. It mm -hmm. is worth it. Um, the last phase is phase four, which is, you know, really now with the population, you know, post-marketing surveillance. The drug is out there, but we're still gathering um, safety information. And FDA is monitoring just in case, you know, you know, we pick up some idiosyncratic um, um, drug reactions. Um, so drug discovery, clinical trial has been very interesting. Um, it's moving ahead. It's making a lot of um, advances. And, but it's interesting to just note, this is just, you know, something exciting to share that sometimes in the process of clinical trials, we stumble upon, <laughs> Um, drugs accidentally that, you know, are beneficial. One of such is Rogaine, which was um, an anti, originally an anti hypertensive And during the study, during the a clinical trial, they found out that the participants, the women were growing um, so much hair. <laughs> you know, you can see that picture 
<laughs> I just show that to tickle you, you know, just growing air in all the wrong places. And um, so at the end of the day, that's a new discovery. We now have that uh, a topical formulation, minoxidil, that is used for air growth. So all the way clinical trials, it's, it's just vital, it's key. Yeah, we can ignore the bad history that has led to, you know, lingering mistrust, especially with the black people. And uh, the most common and most popular history is that about, uh, is that of the um, Tuskegee um, research where um, African-American males um, were really treated badly. This was in the 1930s um, to 1972. They had syphilis. Um, they were researching, you know, in Alabama and um, 600 to 700 African-American males. And um, so when the advent of pe um, penicillin, you know, antibiotics came that they should have given to this participant to treat, they didn't treat. At the end of the day, um, they had a lot of complications. Some went blind, some had um, long-term neurological, um, you know, complications, um, mental issue. Some died, a lot died. In fact, the last participant died recent, not so recent, but 2004. So this was a huge, huge, huge problem. But, you know, like every problem, you know, that's why I like, um, I, well, I like America, you see. When we have a problem, um, there's always a good or there's always, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. It leads to something, something good. It, something good can be bettered out of this. Because of this, um, we, you know, it led to stricter guidelines and regulation in um, U.S. government-funded um, research. It also led to the establishment of Tuskegee University National Center for um, bioethics in research and healthcare. Um, and it's also encouraged a lot of, you know, regulation and surveillance of, you know, when people say they're um, conducting a clinical trials, is it ethical? We're, you know, we're protecting, they're out there or survey, you know, surveying and observing, making sure that uh, the rights and the welfare of um, people are protected. So we really have a lot of safeguards in place um, like I said, yes, that um, clinical trial, the Tuskegee experiment led to a lingering deep mistrust, um, but we have new guidelines to protect um, people who participate in um, clinical trial. Um, we also have very huge, you know, you can talk to any researcher that we don't mention, we don't talk about um, ICH, GCP is an international agreed um, standard now for research. It guides everything that is done during a clinical trial. Um, you know, it protects the right, safety, welfare of participants. It also minimizes, you know, human exposure to, you know, to new investigational product. It also improves the quality of data that is being collected because we can't ignore the fact that yes, the pharmaceutical companies want to make money. It's, it can be business, but um, there's nothing to fear because we also have regulations, compliance. And I tell you in my line of work, you, if you mess up, they, they, you know, they, they red flag you, you know, you can lose your license. I'm talking about clinicians now, MDs, um, if you're caught doing anything on, on ethical. So, Clinical trial is pretty much safe. It's very well regulated. You have so many people looking out for you. And these guidelines, um, are, you know, they, they have guidelines about ethics, how you must conduct the research. Um, it also guides against, um, you know, the trial risk versus benefit. And then something very huge, which is informed consent um, from your participant. I mean, you can just, what happened in Tuskegee can never happen today you know, where you you just enroll people into a clinical study and um, you don't inform them, they don't know what's going on, that can't happen. That's why we have informed consent. Um, you have to present all the information um, about the study, about the clinical trial, as well as even alternatives that are there and you give the patient room, you know, to make the decision to participate. 
Um, it also guides again, um, uh, it provides guidelines as well about the medicinal product. Um, so from all I've been saying, you can see there are many players in clinical trials. Um, we have the sponsors, which, you know, majorly that's the pharmaceutical company, but we also have um, big institution hospitals who, you know, can sponsor an investigation. Um, then we have the institutional review board, which are, which are the ethical committees. These are the people who review the, you know, from the initiation of a, of a clinical trial and even during the course of the clinical trial, they are reviewing um, because this is involving human um, subjects and their primary purpose is to make sure everyone is protected, the right and welfare of human subjects. Of course, we have the clinical investigators, the MDs, the clinicians and the hospitals, you know, clinics. Um, and then we have um, um, partners like independent um, safety review committee, very key. I mean, recently um, it's been in the news about AstraZeneca um, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, why can't they move ahead? Why isn't the FDA approving them? So they, they had provided a different set of data to um, the independent, uh, an independent um, safety review committee. And then they presented another set of data to FDA. So um, as the FDA was about reviewing and about to approve, you know, the independent safety review committee spoke out that look, the data were inconsistent. So you see how clinical trial is really um, regulated. You have so many people looking out. Um, of course, the FDA, the big guys, these are the ones that will review when you've gathered your data, you say, oh, um, this thing works, this is what we found. They're gonna scrutinize that data um, before they will approve and let you market that drug. We have the Department of Health and Human Services, they are all involved. Um, how many more minutes do I have? So here's the key of this presentation. Why should you participate in clinical trials? You as a black man or um, woman or ethnic minority, um, there's a terminology now where they, ref they refer, um, I mean, liberal racial ethnic minority groups, people were doing research, people like Dr. Kingsley, you know, and just, and, um, you know, a, a lot of foundation are helping in this, just trying to work with this group because it just seems like um, the world is moving ahead and we're being left behind. And yet we're all exposed to the same problems, this diseases, this cancer. So um, how do we know this, these drugs will work for us um, if we don't participate, we're not, it's not been tested on us. So that, that's why it's important. Um, you will know we, we have ge genetic differences. So that's a key reason why um, people of Afro descent should participate in clinical trials. Um, we know that compounds don't work the same way in all people. In fact, um, with women and children, the, most of the drugs don't work the same way for them. So now the FDA has determined that studies should include women and children. So if you have a, 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 a drug compound you want to market out there and they'll be used by this group, then it ought to be tested on them. So, so that's, that's the rationale um, to just make sure that um, we determine that the effect of the drug, you know, under the control conditions in clinical trials, as opposed to the uncontrolled um, use in, you know, in the population that, you know, um, we determine that effect in our people, in ourselves. And I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in there. Okay, so what I was trying to say, let me read from my slide is that uh, um, all that talk is that we need um, to have blacks in cancer research so that we can ensure that the medicines that are out there that have been developed to, ad to be administered to patients with cancer uh, um, demonstrate the intended benefits, mm -hmm. you know, in clinical trials that adequately represent diversity. Okay, so um, what I always, what always comes to mind for me is that, um, is the issue of anti, um, anti hypertensives so for many years, blacks were being treated with antihypertensives that were not really effective in them because um, we have a different, you know, pathophysiology of hypertension in us. Our own hypertension is salt sensitive, you know, 
So, you know, things like ACE inhibitors and B beta blockers, there's more suitable to the Caucasians, to the white population, not to the black, but for a long time, that was what everybody was getting until, you know, study revealed that no, um, for black with uh, um, hypertensives, um, the first line should be diuretic. So this is why it's so key, it's so important um, that we are involved in um, clinical trials. So my observation, and this I'm talking from practical experience. I'm out there um, like um, Linda, what are we seeing? You know, we are the one, we work with the sponsors, we, we work with the site, um, we, we're working with the participants in clinical trials. And I just wanted to share this observation. You know, it might not be 100%, but this is what I am seeing from a practical um, standpoint. So I see that the number of black patients that are enrolled in clinical trials is very negligent, very negligent. Um, and I also see another pattern is that black patients diagnosed with cancers tend to do worse. Um, they have high mortality rate than their white counterpart. Um, and it's it's not a, a far fetch. I mean, you can you can know, you can tell why there are all those other um, health inequalities and, and um, inequities. Um, but also, there's also this fact that um, we're not we're, because we're not involved in clinical trials that um, are testing out new treatment. Um, okay, let me put it this way. So we I see a lot of patient benefit immensely from new cancer therapies under research. You know, um, these are people who have had all the first and second and third lines of treatment. Um, that's the standard of care treatment that we know. And it didn't work, they're progressing. So the only, well, not that the only option, but one of the options they have is to try this new treatment. So oftentimes a new cancer treatment under research is all that is available to prolong life when all the others when all, all the other standard of care treatment fail. So the people who participate benefit from it. And um, now we're seeing like, you know, we're seeing that cancers like breast, prostate, like Tonya mentioned, are so advanced now in um, new treatment, which of course came through clinical trials. Now we have survivors living much longer than we used to see a few years ago. Um, of course, we will not ignore the gross health in inequality and inequities in minority communities, you know, health insurance issues, clinical, um, you know, not being able to afford this treatment. But in a way, clinical trials give access to this free, um, access to free new therapies, which, by the way, when they get to the market, they are very, very, very expensive. So also seeing breakthrough in cancer that is so refreshing, so promising, you know, that um, apart from the traditional standard of care of chemotherapy, which is wrought with so many toxicities, you know, um, of course we have radiotherapy and surgery, they are often used as first line of um, treatment, but now um, cancer research is coming up with Unbelievable, um, unbelievable results. We have immunotherapy. We have targeted cell immunotherapy. We have things like CAR T, T cell transfer therapy, you know, using cells from the patient's immune system to eliminate cancer. Um, so we really need to participate in this. And of course, they're also using gene therapy and we're genetically different. So if we don't participate, how will we know if this work? Um, even recently, Recently, we're also using vaccines, uh, messenger RNA, just like, you know, the COVID um, um, compound to also treat cancer. So these are very promising. And in conclusion, I think that um, participation in clinical trials is altruistic. It's, it's a noble thing to do. Is you making your contribution to life advancement. Um, there is no... Um, information you cannot get. Um, I just want to throw that out there that, uh, you know, sometimes um, get curious. 
And there's a website where you can go to, you will get information about ongoing clinical trials, um, the location, the sites, hospitals that is offering them, you know, the sponsors um, or the investigators. You also get information about the drug, you know, synopsis about the, the new drug and the study itself. So you can go there, check this thing out. You can enroll through this website as well. You can talk to your doctor, you know, um, are there any clinical trials out there that I can benefit? What's my next step? I mean, these are great options because what do I see on the field? What's the other alternative? Sometimes cancer patient gets to that point where all they're offering them is go to the hospice and wait for death. What could be worse than that? So clinical trials does a lot. I, I encourage um, our people, everyone, um, to just make their own quota, just make your contribution in life advancement. And um, I would end, I would end here. I think I've, I'm way past my 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Echo. Uh, we are very, very grateful for your uh, expert point of view. Uh, so before I, we move on to the next speaker, we're going to do a quick poll just to see where people are. So, and it's anonymous, so your name is not going to be coming up. So um, Nana, if we can have the first question up, just so people can participate. Other question, so go ahead and submit. So the first one, uh, well, prior to this conversation, did you know what a clinical trial is? Have you participated in any? Um, has anyone you know participated in a clinical trial? What are your thoughts on clinical trials? Uh, before the webinar. And so what are your thoughts now based on what you've heard Dr. Echo um, talk to us about? So just go ahead quickly. Let this be our, uh, our very ice uh, breaker. I'm going ahead and I'm submitting. And we will look at the data later on. So while we're answering that, I am going to go ahead and present our next speaker. She is Dr. Linda Agu. And so Dr. Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. She's also a, a medical doctor uh, by expertise, but she's also in the clinical research space. Over to you, Dr. Linda. Hello, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Tony. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Tony, thank you so much for inviting me for this um, program. Um, like um, Cynthia said, this is a noble cause. I have a passion uh, for clinical trials. And that's why I've spent 12 years in um, oncology trials. I really applaud you for what you're doing. Thank you, Cynthia, Dr. Cynthia Echo for that presentation. And thank you too for um, Dr. Kinsley Echo that will be coming on um, much later. So without further ado, uh, my business today is to talk on clinical trials in diasporic communities and also to talk on inclusion and diversity in clinical trials. Um, Nana has my slides, but if she doesn't have it, that's okay. Wow, the slide is coming up. Next slide, please. Um, so introduction, again, I'm not going to overflow the issue. Um, Cynthia did an awesome presentation of clinical trials. So I'm going to be talking today about the barriers to participating, participation in clinical trials, um, inclusion and diversity in clinical trials, and then conclusion, and then take any questions if any. So in regards to um, barriers to clinical trials, one of the significant barriers I see is the belief. The belief of the uh, fact that a lot of people have mistrust in the scientific community. Just like Cynthia mentioned earlier, the Tuskegee effect is one that no one wants to happen again. So that trust, there's the misbelief, there's the, we don't trust um, a lot of Africans and diasporic um, in communities, they don't trust the scientific review. They feel that, oh, they did this before, there's a tendency that it can happen again. And you know, they said ignorance is bliss. So um, today we're trying to break those barriers. Another barrier is this lack of representation of ethnic minorities in clinical trials. So most of the people that have cancer, they don't even enroll in clinical trials. 
Like I said, I've been doing clinical trials in oncology for 12 years, and I see a lot of misrepresentation in clinical trials. Um, there's lack of collaboration with African communities. So if, for example, if you're doing clinical trials, you want Africa, just like our, our first speaker said, for example, about hypertension. The, tr the treatment for, um, af for Africans and the Caucasians is quite different. And so if you want to get the African people involved in this clinical trial, you need to go to their community. You need to have structures in place. Like, is there someone that I speak, if it's a Haitian community, what any, any infrastructures you can put in place to help people in that community so that they can better understand the barriers. Another thing that helps is that, um, another thing that's a barrier is that, um, a lot of African people are not willing to participate in clinical trials because they feel that they're going to be used as a guinea pig. Like I said earlier, they're going to be used as a guinea pig. So we're here to enlighten everyone that there is need. For example, I just did my um, COVID-19 vaccine and I know how my family people were looking at me. Everyone, even when they were like, oh, did you start? They wanted to see if I started growing horns on my head or my ears, I started popping. Uh, so I, I, so it, it, even me in the clinical, in the clinical um, trial, you know, I still have to tell myself, hey, Linda, you have to take this vaccine, at least to show someone. So I took the vaccine and I showed them, I said, I took the vaccine, so it's safe, everyone can take it. So um, another thing is, one of the barriers is people don't talk about clinical trials among the African community a lot. So it's something we want to talk to, um, like in the church community. In NGOs like this, we encourage that things like this should be addressed. When they're having church programs, when they're having meetings, you're having meetings with your friends, encourage them, talk about it. It's, it's the new thing that's gonna let people be aware, create the awareness about engage in a dialogue, even at workplace. So right now, if you're going to clinical trials, if you're trying to um, enroll a site for clinical trials, we wanna find out what is their diversity and inclusion capacity like? What, how many studies have they done? So we want to look at the data and see what they've done, how many people have been enrolled in their studies. So we want to see that engagement going on, that dialogue going on. Check mindset. One of the things too is the mindset. Like I said, most people think, oh, the clinical trials is not for us. It's only for Caucasian, it's not. So enable people, teach them, um, empower them and let them know that clinical trials is for everyone. Also, I try to ask people to demonstrate empathy. That's a barrier. Demonstrate empathy with these people. Don't feel that, oh, because they have this disease, that means they are, you know, that's the end of it. Let them create that awareness, feel with them, and let them know, oh, you can benefit from this. There's a treatment that is going on. You can do this. You can join this. Um, I always say praise the Lord because I'm always in the church. I almost say praise the Lord. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about the next uh, barrier. Another, the next topic I want to talk on is inclusion and diversity in clinical trials. So um, most clinical trials do not score highly on diversity front. It, it, it's a shaming. It, it's, it's a shame and very appalling to, I have to tell you that again, I have been in this business for a long and I see that there's disparity. Um, clinical trials form the cornerstone of new drugs. And so without volunteers and participants from all over the race, you're not going to get a clean data. So um, from the study, I found out um, there's on an average in a clinical trial, they found out of 145 people, 63% of the people were from, out of, sorry, they found out only out of 145 people, that's 63% of the 230 trials included only black few just very few percentage had um, minority i'm going to break that down so on the average there was like 76.3 percent of the participants were white 18.3 percent were black 3.1 percent were asian 6.1 percent was hispanic i'll take that uh, uh, data again 76.3 percent of the participants were white 18.3 percent were black 3.1 percent were asian and 6.1% was Hispanic. Um, I see Tony uh, nodding ahead. It, it's, um, it's very alarming. Black and Hispanic people are we're consistently being underrepresented compared to the Caucasians. And there should be a paradigm shift. With what is going on now, there should be a change. I think should work up. We, we should change that, that shift. There should, we should change that mindset. The, 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 the data needs to flip. They need to work on that. So why is it important 
Why is diversity important? So there are many factors that can influence how um, individuals react to a drug, along with the age, just like Dr. Absinthe had said. So different race reacts to drugs in different ways. Um, a study shows that lack of diversity in clinical trial is a moral, scientific, and medical issue. So it is important that trials is not just homogeneous. That you don't just consider um, one primary gender or the, everything should be added. The race should be added so that the findings are not being skewed. If you have different representation of different ethnicity, we're going to have a good data, just like um, Dr. Cynthia said, we're going to have clean data. The essence of clinical trials is to produce new drugs. So if you're doing just drug that does not, uh, it's not broad, it's, it does not cover every race, how would you be able to bring a clean data? So we need to find um, results that are not skewed in clinical knowledge. And we need to, for example, cardiovascular health and outcomes, they vary very well among racial people, just like she said. It is important for clinical trials participants to reflect the diversity of population in ongoing clinical trials. So in every society you see for the Caucasian, for example, I'm gonna speak about one of a site that I, I worked on, a, a Spanish speaking community. We need to get the structures in place. Like for example, in that site, like I said, the work of a CRA is to bridge the drug company and the clinical research organization and, make, and ensure that the patient is being treated well, the clinical trial is being conducted according to the ICH guidelines and principles. So in a place like that, you're having a, a Spanish community. Part of the clinical setting, part of the settings there in the trial should have a Spanish speaking person, a Spanish speaking person that will help, that will help um, the, the patient. Just like you go to some stores and you see that some stores, you have some stores that basically do all the people if not 90% of the people working in the counter, they are from one origin. Why is that? So in clinical trials, it's good to broaden that spectrum so that we have people at the site that are helping patients. If it's a black community, know the kind of things here. Provide structures in place. And also another barrier I've seen that clinical trial that's causing problems in clinical trials with the um, uh, minorities is that sometimes the clinical trial, the design of the clinical trial does not fit into our program does not fit into something that includes the uh, minority uh, minority community. So it's important for clinical trials to reflect this diversity. Diversity, racial and ethnic minority participation helps researchers find better treatment and better ways to conduct clinical trials. You see, so we've talked about it. We've talked about it. It's like a, a, I don't want to oversound it, but it is something that needs to change. We need to see more discussion on clinical trials so that. This awareness can go. So our children, if the first thing you tell someone about clinical trials is say, oh, I don't want to be, it's not for me. So we want to change that uh, mindset that clinical trials is for everybody. So we need all hands on this. We need this, um, those researchers, the drug companies to conclude it. We need FDA to work on it. We need FDA to see what was, what is the inclusivity? What did you put? Where, where are the data? The data needs to work on. We need you and I, just like um, Tony is doing, so we need to create the awareness to people and let them know how we can help. This is an avenue of exposure to people. Let people know that this can help. This exposure to cancer and clinical trials and the barriers, inclusion and diversity, it's very, very important. And so that is just a summary of my presentation. It's not a big presentation, but I just want to let people know that uh, the time has come for a change. Um, this is the new set, this is a new time, this is a new generation. We need to see more data that includes um, African-American. We need to see the numbers flip. We need to see the data change. We need to see a step up. They're working towards it. At least it's better than what it was before, but we need to see more awareness. We need to see more change in this data. We need to see because like what she said earlier, if we include the diverse, a diverse um, community, it will help to treat people correctly. It will help to save all the, even the uh, outcomes. We'll see different results in our, uh, in, our, in our clinical trials. It will help to broaden it. And um, I think clinical research, we have a long way to go. And I see it in the next few, five, 10 years, moving towards the right directions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Linda. Um, and uh, we're very grateful for your point of view. So we've, uh, we've talked